Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Douglas Queen, and I am a consultant at Perfuse MedTech. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to today's webcast entitled Innovation Through Stimulation, the Gecko Circulation Support. Today's webcast will explore the delivery of a low-frequency nerve stimulation, or L LFNS for short, treatment via the new Gecko device which helps boost circulation using innovative electrical stimulation technology. The presentation will identify challenges associated with developing effective compression for lower limbs as well as outlining existing literature, expert opinion and protocols for the use of LFNS for the common perineal nerve as an adjunct to best practice treatment of lower leg ulcers. To help us understand how Gecko can be utilised effectively, I would like to introduce today's speaker, Keith Harding, who is the Chief Medical Officer of the Welsh Wound Innovation in the centre in the UK. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, I would now like to hand the presentation over to our presenter, Professor Keith Harding. Thank you very much, Douglas. Um, this is, as Douglas says, a, a seminar presenting innovation through stimulation. Um, I have come from the United Kingdom to give this presentation today. Uh, you will see I have a number of affiliations uh, and I also have a number of fellowships at various royal colleges in the United Kingdom. The interesting thing is not the number of fellowships or the other the titles necessarily, other than the fact that the Dean of Clinical Innovation at a Russell Group University in the United Kingdom uh, means that we spend an awful lot of our time looking at innovative ways of dealing with important clinical problems. I do have many potential conflicts of interest and it's up to you, the viewers of this presentation, to determine whether those conflicts have influence or bias my approach to things. Uh, I have run a self-funded group uh, in an academic centre for the past 25 years. Uh, I am a co-inventor along with one of my uh, university colleagues of a, a number of uh, patents uh, associated with diagnosis and therapeutic treatments for patients with wounds. In getting to this meeting, I have to disclose that First Kind Limited provided support for air travel and hotel accommodation, uh, and the group, the Welsh Wound Innovation Centre, which I am involved with, has received research funding to evaluate the Gecko device. The objectives of my presentation are to help the participants recognise the challenges remain in developing effective compression for lower limb wounds. Be aware of the existing literature, expert opinion, and protocols for the use of LFNS, of which Gecko is an example, to the common perineal nerve as an adjunct to best practice treatment of lower leg ulcers. One of the big challenges that we face in the area of wounds and wound healing is the perception that the public have of wounds. This image here is unquestionably a wound, and it is a trivial wound, but it is a wound that most of us will suffer from at some stage in our life. The difficulty, however, is the fact that when we look at innovation, it is not about making a better band-aid. It is about stuff that we do that makes a difference and benefits patients and society. And it consists not only of technological innovation, such as this device where, where modality we're talking about today, but it also consists of service and process innovation, the way in which we actually deliver care to patients in whatever healthcare system we are operating in. It also needs to recognize the role of the patients or the citizens in society and them undertaking a process of social innovation and perhaps getting themselves more involved in their own care either in health promotion behavior but also in terms of providing care to themselves when we're offering them a therapeutic modality to try and treat a clinical problem. I come from the university where uh, Professor Archie Cochran was based when he uh, described the RCT as the gold standard of evidence. This quote from Donald Rumsfeld is, is interesting because a lot of words are on the slide, but the, the thing that I've highlighted is simply because you do not have evidence that something does exist does not mean that you have evidence that it doesn't exist. 
And this is the challenge that we face in many aspects of wounds and wound healing because we are very much in our infancy of developing this as a, a credible uh, clinical subject uh, in a modern day era of evidence-based medicine because there is very little evidence for most, if not everything, that we do in the wound healing space. And as a consequence of that, uh, we have to challenge ourselves is to say, how do we know what we're offering to patients is the best if we're not really able to benchmark it against many other things? And one of the key elements of what we do in patients with lower leg wounds is use compression bandages. I have to uh, advise you this is a patient coming into my clinic, not going out of my clinic. And one of the biggest challenges that you face with compression bandages is not necessarily the uh, fact that compression bandages are a good thing to do for many lower leg wounds, but how do you get them on, how do you keep them on, how do you get them off, and how do you ensure that the person or persons applying them are applying them in a safe and efficacious manner. And although compression has existed since the time of Hippocrates, uh, who was one of the first clinicians to recognize that compression was an e essential element of treating lower leg wounds. There are still some dilemmas that exist some 2,000 years later in that do we really understand how compression works? Is it a specific pressure? Is it control of edema is a better measure of determining adequacy of, of compression? Is it limited by the patient, whether it's patient concordance, adherence or compliance? What is the direct test of efficacy of adequate compression? Most of us use the surrogate of whether a wound's healed or has got smaller or not. What is graduated compression all about? It is something that many of us have, have preached for many years, but more recently there is talk about progressive and regressive compression as a better way of understanding how we, you apply the compression up the leg. What about availability? What I would do in a patient in the United Kingdom is not what you would do with a patient here in Canada. How can we get patients more involved and undertake social innovation? And where's the role of the patient's choice? And where do you as clinicians get your knowledge and skills and attitude to change your current practice and current dogma around how you use compression? And finally, and perhaps more importantly, is how do you measure success? As I've mentioned, we usually use complete healing as a measure of success, but in many situations there are other problems that the patients are experiencing which are more challenging for them rather than whether that wound is healed or not. And that the uh, figure on the right of this slide is to show sub-bandage pressure sensing and what happens when you walk a patient. So that the sub-bandage pressures change, not necessarily at rest, but when the patient is active. There are many indications for compression bandaging. The obvious ones are venous insufficiency, lymphedema, and lipedema. But it is important to recognize that there are many other causes of edema of a lower limb. You might want to challenge me on my provocative, deliberately provocative suggestion that the indications of compression are on any swollen leg that does not have ischemic or inflammatory disease that is uncontrolled. It is my opinion that that may be something we should be moving to, but as it, in everything in medicine, there are always caveats, there are always exceptions where we wouldn't use uh, a particular intervention. This review by Hugo Parch in the British Journal of Dermatology in 2015 looks at the effects of compression in reducing edema, in having effect on venous narrowing, microcirculation uh, and cytokine release, and arterial inflow. There are many ways in which we could apply compression and many of us will use one or more of these uh, systems potentially routinely or in certain subgroups of patients with lower leg wounds where we genuinely feel that this is based on our experience and to some extent evidence uh, the appropriate form of compression to apply to that particular patient with that particular leg problem. But I think the important thing is to recognize that many of these uh, methods of compression are not perfect. The important thing is to identify exactly where, when, and how to use these different forms of compression. And we as clinicians should have a therapeutic toolbox that includes a variety of methods of compression to offer effective compression to the largest number of patients we see. 
this Wounds International Consensus document I was involved in producing in 2016 recognized that there were many factors that influenced the use of compression. One of the biggest challenges of the healthcare system, and I've listed here some of the factors that uh, relate to the healthcare system which influence whether a system is used or not used. It is also important to recognize as well as the healthcare system factors, there are clinician factors. Should we be training every clinician who sees a patient or might see a patient with a leg wound to apply a simple and safe form of compression? Or should we be saying this is uh, a, an intervention that can have negative consequences for the uh, for the patient if it is in, applied by a non-specialist and therefore compression should be seen as a specialist role. How do we make sure that we're giving patients uh, uh, the appropriate form of uh, compression because of the clinician, clinicians involved in the care of that patient being the most appropriate and best trained to provide care. The other fact, set of factors that influence compression is patient factors. Uh, and one of the things that I think we as clinicians are bad at is blaming the patient when something doesn't work. Where in effect, it may be that the patient hasn't followed the advice that we've given because they, we don't recognize or appreciate the number of factors that will influence their ability to uh, adhere to or to be concordant with uh, whatever advice that we're actually giving to them. Because these are four patients of mine with different diseases affecting their leg and the challenge of clinical practice is how would you, how would I, how would all of us compress these patients? Where is the evidence that clearly states that there is a specific form of compression that's the most appropriate and most effective to treat these individual patients? can tell you from my own experience, you won't find any of these patients in clinical trials of compression because none of these have venous disease in isolation from other factors. One of the other things that's also important is to recognize that in assessing patients for compression is the ability uh, and uh, knowledge of the limb methods and limitations of looking at vascular flow in the limb. Now we can use the ankle brachial pressure index for big vessels. Uh, we can use the toe pressure index uh, or transcutaneous oxygen pressure uh, to be inferring whether you have adequate arterial inflow into a limb. You can actually look at arterial uh, photoplethysmography uh, to measure toe pressures as a, a method of measuring uh, uh, flow in medium vessels and you can also look at waveform patterns to actually determine whether there is abnormal arterial inflow, not necessarily in the main vessels, the, the large vessels, but in the medium vessels. More recently, a technique has been developed, this skin perfusion pressure, uh, which is looking at vascular measurement in small vessels. What we have to do is to recognize that many of the assessments that we do look at the flow in the arterial system at main vessels where vascular surgeons, radiologists can carry out an intervention that may improve that flow. What we may need to do when we're looking at compression is looking at vascular assessment in the, the large, medium size and the little vessels to determine that the flow is appropriate through all of those caliber vessels to determine that, that we are not compromising the circulation. That is in addition to measuring venous re return or, or volume of venous return uh, that's coming back up the leg. So when we go forward with compression, there are a number of things that we need to consider. Can we improve the diagnosis of the underlying disease that that patient has got on their lower limb? Can we treat the venous disease wherever possible? Vascular interventions, vein harvesting. Can we sclerose these veins more accurately and more precisely? Can we understand how and how much compression should be used in an individual patient with a particular disease and a particular shaped leg? Can we uh, develop more effective compression systems that are more responsive to patients' activity, self-managed by the patients or their family members, 
comfortable and allow the patient to be much more involved front and center in managing their own care. And can I be deliberately provocative by saying that the future may be improving venous return without compression? This is the device Gecko. This is the, uh, the first patient that I use Gecko on. This is a fairly standard venous ulcer in my practice, bearing in mind I run a mainly secondary or tertiary referral practice. And this is where we're actually using laser speckle contrast imaging to show the changes in small vessel flow uh, in and around the ulcer. The image on the left at baseline is the changes in the laser speckled imaging uh, in, uh, uh, in terms of the heartbeat. So you will see changes in the normal cardiac cycle. The image on the right is the change in laser speckle flow uh, when you actually stimulate the common perineal nerve. At the bottom of the slide, uh, th this form of uh, vascular flow talks of measuring flux. You can see that there are significant increases in flux in the wound bed and the peri-wound area uh, when they are stimulated uh, uh, with this device as compared to the baseline. This provides me with some degree of ammunition to convince myself, and I was spec uh, skeptical, as I suspect some of you are, that there is something happening when you stimulate this nerve in these patients with leg problems. Now in terms of stimulation, we can all have differing views. Could be coffee, could be chocolate, it's a different method. Could be, we all need it from time to time, whether it's high energy drinks or some form of med pharmacological manipulation. But it is also important to recognize we all have our favorites. And what works for one of us is not going to work for the other. What you also need to recognize is that stimulation can be good. Make you feel really well, make you better. Sometimes it can be bad. We don't need too much stimulation because uh, we can get exhausted by it. Sometimes it's shocking. And sometimes it's downright pleasurable. The important thing is that that will vary depending on you and your views as a clinician and the patient's views uh, of what's going on. In terms of electrical stimulation, it is used in many forms and the results are based on the parameters of its use to. Encourage changes in muscle action and function, increase strength, increase strength and range of motion, reduce edema, enhance blood flow, heal tissue and decrease pain. The important thing is that there, not all electrical stimulation is the same. There are three types shown here, neuromuscular electrical stimulation, functional electrical stimulation, and the one that most of us are probably more familiar with is TENS, or transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. The important thing is that these terms are often used interchangeably, leading to confusion. But the important thing is not so much the terminology, but what the parameters of the machine that you're using is, is influencing to determine its effects. And here on this slide we have examples of neuromuscular electrical stimulation, transcutaneous electrical stimulation, and functional electrical stimulation. You can see the effects in the middle column, and you can see examples on the right. A new innovative approach to electrical stimulation is the use of low frequency nerve stimulation or LFNS. At low frequencies of nerve stimulation, specifically targeting the common perineal nerve, so a pain-free muscle contraction is produced, is the basis of uh, this device. The results of these low frequency interventions combined have a cumulative effect, so it does not necessarily have to be applied 24 hours a day. I was fortunate to be invited to provide a, an editorial to this uh, Canadian consensus document uh, that was produced last year uh, under the auspices of the Canadian Association of Wound Care. Uh, this is a useful uh, expert opinion uh, document that may help clarify some of your questions and concerns. It is important to recognize that this document would suggest that the body of available evidence to date shows that LFNS provides a cumulative effect by providing pain control, improving blood flow, reducing venous hypertension, and supporting wound healing. 
the issue of pain control and quality of life is also important. And that is why I mentioned the traditional way of measuring success is whether we've healed a patient or not. Because there may be other ways in which we can determine whether we've carried out any benefits for patients. And the LFNS causes the release of endogenous opiates and hormones within the body, enabling the body to release its own pain relief mechanisms. It tends to have a longer lasting effect and can have a whole body effect when compared to other methods of electrical stimulation used for pain relief. In terms of improved blood flow, uh, because of the uh, challenges of the different diseases that can cause wounds to occur and wounds to be difficult to heal, restoring blood flow should be uh, uh, something we'd all accept as, as a me basic mechanism of our intervention to try and get wounds to heal. And the important thing is that the LFNS can have cellular effects uh, by influencing fibrinolysis within the uh, uh, the small vessels and enhancing blood flow. It can reduce venous hypertension which is influenced by a number of anatomical factors and site of, of venous disease. Uh, the important thing is that the mechanism by which uh, uh, LFNS influences venous hypertension needs further work to truly understand exactly uh, where, when and how it is influencing the venous system. And in terms of wound healing, if you compare direct electrical stimulation against low-frequency uh, neuromuscular stimulation, uh, the important thing is that the direct electrical stimulation stimulates the wound directly, whereas LFNS optimizes the condition for wound healing and may well have multiple benefits, uh, uh, not just targeted at one aspect of, of that patient's care. Within that document, you will also see uh, the way in which it is suggested uh, that this device can influence edema, pain, uh, and in patients with decreased arterial inflow. The important thing is that all of these things can be linked to venous disease, and then the minor trauma that's associated to the leg leads to venous ulceration. The conclusion from this consensus process undertaken in Canada it said last year that at this time literature to support the use of LFNS over the common perineal nerve and wound healing specifically in venous leg ulceration is limited and in general is product specific. Many of the reported case studies included multiple wound types and it's difficult to discern how the therapy impacted venous leg ulceration specifically. And although current literature is inconclusive, as it is in many other aspects of wound healing practice, there is m emerging evidence so showing that this modality does have benefit in addressing pain and neuropathy, venous stasis and blood flow. And the important thing is these are all factors that can influence the patient's uh, ability to heal their venous leg ulcer. So in terms of using this device over the, the common perineal nerve, it is important to recognize that this is what this device does. 10 gram uh, self-contained uh, single patient use device that applies uh, low frequency at one hertz stimulation of the common perineal uh, nerve in the lower leg, has a battery and a self-adhesive electrode. Uh, the stimulation is turned up slowly uh, for a patient uh, to be able to tolerate that and to see a visible twitch of the muscle uh, down the lateral border of the foot. Uh, the device does not produce a full range of muscle contraction as devices of much higher frequency do that. And the important thing is at this moment in time uh, patients using this device are being asked to wear it for six hours a day as compared to 24 hours a day. In Health Canada, this device is uh, indicated for improving blood circulation, promoting wound healing, treating ischemia, treating venous insufficiency, prevention and treatment of edema, and prevention of DVT, which was the original uh, clinical problem this product was targeted at treating. In terms of its use, this is the device strapped around the uh, leg just below the, the patella, the kneecap, uh, and uh, the button on the top is what you actually press. It works by stimulating the common perineal nerve to activate calf and foot muscle pumps. It increases blood flow volume and velocity 
and it achieves a blood flow rate of up to 60% of that achieved by continuous walking, as evidenced from these publications uh, shown here. The other thing that's also interesting is that it delivers uh, venous arterial microcirculatory flow enhancement as demonstrated here and supported by these references uh, at the bottom of this slide. But the important thing is that it does no, it has no impact on um, the heart rate blood, or blood pressure and a small impact on coronary circulation. The benefits are to reduce uh, edema by improving blood flow and also then reducing pain. These are case studies from colleague, clinical colleagues in Canada who've used this device. This is a patient with a seven-year history of bilateral ulcers from the London Health Science Centre and got a 100% reduction in surface area in 18 weeks in both legs. The important thing is that the baseline on the, the right leg is shown here. At four weeks, it's shown in the middle, and at 18 weeks, it's completely closed. The important thing, 100% reduction in surface area in 18 weeks in both legs. Another Canadian case study is case study two, a patient with a seven-year history with 100% reduction in surface area in 32 weeks, uh, coming from the Hamilton Niagara uh, CCAC. Uh, and here are the uh, images over that 32-week period uh, where this patient had been receiving wound care for seven years prior uh, to using this device. I'm here to provide some international perspective uh, and, and I'm here representing the Welsh Wound Innovation Centre uh, showing my case series and initial experience but also some observations that we've made in terms of reduction of pain uh, and I have to emphasize that the views of my interpretation of what's happening here are, are personal views and not that of Perfuse MedTech. This is the Welsh Wound Innovation Centre that we've developed just outside Cardiff, the capital of Wales, uh, as, as a hub for education and research and coordination of clinical services across the whole of the country of Wales, which is one of the four countries as part of the United Kingdom with a population of three and a half million people. Our evaluation initially was that we would look at 20 participants um, they would have venous ulcers, mixed leg ulcers, and diabetic foot ulcers. Fourteen uh, of those 20, initial 20 patients uh, completed eight weeks evaluation. Two patients healed, ten patients improved, and two pa uh, uh, patients deteriorated. That may not be as impressive as you thought it would be, but please remember, I, uh, by a series of strange processes often end up seeing the worst of the worst of leg ulcers and the ones that have failed to respond to a, a whole suite of interventions pr uh, previously. These figures have now gone up to 32 patients uh, and we're seeing similar uh, outcomes uh, for, for these patients with more of them healing. In terms of attrition, again with 30 years experience of running clinical trials in uh, chronic wounds, these are not in any way surprising to me. Losing patients to follow up, I'll talk in a second about the, the rash, uh, some patient not able to tolerate it, uh, and uh, the non-concordant patient that, was, uh, that we see here. In terms of our outcomes in this first 20 uh, patients we treated, we had a reduction of wound size of around seven, centi seven and a half centimeters. We had an increase in granulation tissue of almost 20%, Here's the interesting piece, is 80% or 79%, if I'm being precise, reported pain reduction. And these were pain reduction on a visual analog score that had gone from moderate or severe to none or mild. Nearly 60% of them had had edema reduction, and 93% of our 20 patients had had one or more positive outcome. So although we may not have healed all of them, we've conveyed benefits to many of these patients. Here's the first patient that uh, we evaluated in this eight-week study, where there is the patient at baseline, there is the patient at endpoint. And if I was you, looking at those images, I'd say, well, you haven't done an awful lot for that poor patient. But when I actually give you this added information, works as a self-employed carpenter, he's had huge problems for many years, he's been a patient of mine for the best part of 20 years. Uh, we heal his ulcers, but what we're not able to do is prevent recurrence. Uh, he has huge problems with pain and 
with most treatments before uh, he would go home after a day's work because he needed to work to earn money, he would then go straight to bed and lie down to try and ease the pain. The interesting thing is that the pain reduced within one week of this. And once we'd finished the eight-week evaluation, uh, he begged me, and I, I'm not joking, he got on his knees in front of me and said, could he please continue with this device because this was the first time in many years he could do a day's work and not be in pain. This is the second patient, again at baseline and endpoint, and again without added information, you might say you haven't achieved an awful lot. But if I tell you this is a retired lady, she was unable to tolerate compression, any form of compression due to pain. She was re recruited to this eight-week evaluation. We reduced the pain within one week to, to a point at which she was able to tolerate short sh stretch compression bandage system due to the gecko device. So I'm not suggesting this replaces compression necessarily, but this is a, an experience where we've been able to get a patient uh, into uh, compression bandages where we'd failed previously, not because we hadn't tried, but she was unable to tolerate the pain. The important thing in case uh, three is here is a, an obvious success. This is a patient at baseline, and that's a patient at eight weeks uh, later uh, at end point with a completely healed wound. The interesting thing for this patient is that she's the primary carrier for a severely disabled child. She had difficulty mobilizing due to the extreme pain in her venous leg ulcers. She was on a whole host of uh, pain relieving medication including opiates. Uh, her pain reduced within one week. She was able to stop all her pain medication within the eighth week of the study and she com achieved complete healing within seven weeks. Three different examples, three different ways in which I could see benefits being conveyed to patients with using this device. I do not believe I have solved the problem of exactly where, when and how to use this. I do not believe that we can use this instead of compression. I do not believe we have every piece of the ammunition or evidence uh, that we need to convince clinicians to try this. But in my experience of nearly 30 years of working in the wound healing space, it's one of the few things that made me sit up and take notice because of the dramatic benefits that these patients were exhibiting. So in summary, low frequency nerve stimulation of the common perineal nerve is a new technology in wound care that has been used in Canada since 2014. The intuitive idea was that stimulating this nerve generates muscle activity that results in improved blood flow in the limb. If one of the factors that lead to chronic ulcers is tissue having impaired blood flow, then improving that blood flow would seem to be a logical approach to healing the wound. And as I've already mentioned, ironically, it was never used, developed initially uh, to treat wounds. It was for uh, DVT prophylaxis uh, on long-haul flights. It was the benefits that were accruing there that made people sit up and think maybe it has an effect on leg wounds. It aids in improving venous and arterial uh, blood flow. Pain individuals suffering from chronic uh, lower leg edema of mixed etiology for the prevention and treatment of lower leg ulcers. And while further research is required, it is something that clinicians should perhaps consider using in challenging and refractory wounds that are responding, that are not responding to traditional treatments. As with all evidence, more research is needed. And yes, more research is ongoing. We're about to undertake a number of uh, clinical studies and, and laboratory evaluations to try and get a better fix on exactly how this uh, modality is conveying benefits and how we may optimize the treatments that we're giving patients with these leg wounds. In terms of patient selection at this moment in time, January 2017, it is suggested that the following patients may benefit from this form of stimulation. If they have stalled chronic leg, lower leg wounds not progressing along an expected healing trajectory, cannot tolerate compression or where it's contraindicated, are unable to exercise, have lower leg neuropathy, have lower leg edema that's contributing to reported pain, and are at risk of developing a DVT. This would cover a significant number, but not all of the patients that I see uh, with lower leg wounds. Because we need the skin adhesive to actually uh, allow the electrode to function, it is important to recognize that 
that increases the risk of skin irritation or skin problems. The important thing to date, around 10% of patients develop this reaction. You can control it with the use of topical steroids and rotating the position of the device, but you should be using it in caution with patients who have skin in impaired skin integrity at the site where you're applying that electrode. I'm not concerned at this figure because a few years ago we published a piece of work to show that in my clinic 50% of the patients attending with lower leg wounds had problems with their surrounding skin in terms of eczema, uh, dermatitis, irritation of one sort or another at some stage during their healing uh, journey with us. To date, in general, this form of stimulation appears to be well tolerated with adverse effects effects limited to muscle soreness and in the case of transcutaneous device these localized skin reactions. I'm not able to say exactly where when or how this will ultimately end up being used but I see this as a very important and very effective toolbox uh, in my armamentarian for actually using uh, this device. There are a number of warnings and precautions uh, that are out there specifically for traditional electrical stimulation, but it's perhaps important to note that none of those uh, warnings and precautions apply uh, to this form of uh, electrical stimulation. In summary, despite the widespread use for uh, this device in treatment of acute muscle injuries and prevention of uh, venous thromboembolism, there is limited literature uh, to the use of this in management of venous leg ulcers. Numerous case studies have been presented at national conferences, mainly in Canada, uh, and are suggesting that this has significant potential. The important thing is, that although I would make the comment uh, ab about this uh, device augmenting circulation and appearing to reduce pain quite consistently in a large proportion of patients, it is important that uh, the pain uh, claim, the reduction of pain claim, is not a uh, labeled claim for this device at present. It's also important to recognize that a group of leading Canadian clinicians and academics have produced this consensus document which I would commend to you. The important thing is to recognize that there are many ways in which you may use this new modality to treat your patients with lower leg wounds where you're currently struggling to achieve benefits. Okay, thank you very much, Keith. We will now open the session to questions from our viewers, and I will ask our moderator to read those questions for us. And now for our first question. Professor Harding, you have been involved in wound care for quite some time. Why did you start using the Gecko device? Uh, interesting, challenging question. Um, I suggest that the major interest was I was aware of the deficiencies of traditional methods of applying compression to limbs with lower leg wounds. I was initially very skeptical. Uh, the uh, speckled uh, image that I show you, laser speckled image I showed you, was one of the things that got me interested in that it may be improving uh, major vessel flow, but it may also be uh, influencing flow down very small vessels, which as a wound healer, I'm more interested in getting blood flow to the wound area or wound base, wound edge, than I am perhaps getting flow down the main arteries in the limb. Because it's without, because with, without that uh, flow into the small vessels, we don't get oxygen delivery to uh, the wound tissue to give it an opportunity of healing. What impact do you think the gecko device will have on patients with wounds? Difficult to be precise, um, but I do think it is a disruptive technology that will add uh, ways of treating patients with leg wounds that we have not had to date. I think the issues around pain reduction, the issues around the ability of using this to enable patients to tolerate more traditional forms of compression are interesting and exciting. Uh, the only way we're really going to understand the true impact of this uh, development is when we have more experience, more research, uh, more 
clinicians facing challenging problems where they're looking for a way out of a difficult situation. How does gecko device differ from compression and can it be used with compression? Um, uh, it's certainly different in the sense that you don't have compression from toes to knee um, so it's different from that point of view uh, is an interesting piece of work that needs to be done is can you enhance the effect of compression by using the gecko device in addition to it uh, we're not saying this replaces compression what we're saying is that if you have a wound that's not healing or a wound you're struggling to control the edema in or a, a, a limb that a, a, a patient with a limb wound that has significant pain this intervention may provide you with another option to improve the standard of care and the, the outcomes that you can actually provide to those patients. Could this device be used on ulcers on the bottom of the foot, on the sole? Don't see any reason why not, but that's a good question because the important thing is that the majority of wounds on the plantar surface of the foot are going to be related to diabetic foot disease. If they have diabetic foot disease due to neuropathy, um, they absolutely need adequate and, and uh, effective offloading. This device is not a replacement for offloading. This device is not a replacement for compression. This device is not an, al uh, an alternative for vascular interventions as and when they are appropriate for those patients. The important thing is to see the innovative approach, thinking outside the box of saying, can we have the same effect of compression, but deliver it in a very different way? Is there any contraindication for use in clients with ischemic disease and are not surgical candidates? Um, not that I'm aware of, but that may not be the official line based on claims in Canada or other geographies. Dr. Queen? Mm. I don't think so, no. Can patients self-manage with this device, or can they be managed by family? That was one of the interesting things that we observed uh, in our uh, initial case series, was that although they were nervous initially, it was interesting how getting the patients more involved, more engaged uh, in their own care, uh, over time they became more and more confident, more and more effective uh, and were feeling as if they were part of the clinical team caring for themselves because the important thing in our healthcare system is that in a community setting um, patients are not actively encouraged to be involved in their own care. The advantage of this is that you can easily instruct the patients or their, their carers to apply the device, you don't have the skills, need to have the skills of applying compression bandaging that you do with more traditional methods of compression. Is the device available on the open market and if so, how much is the device? Dr. Queen? The device is available on the open market. Uh, patients can get it by going to um, www.geckodevices.com and the device works out at $100 per day. That's what's used. Could someone with paralysis use this? No sensation? I see no reason why not, but before I would wish anybody to go out and try that and find that there's problems, it's, it's part of my view is if you take a technology such as this, do not necessarily see it as the cure to all problems that exist in clinical practice, but if you think it may be appropriate uh, under controlled circumstances or under supervision, you might want to uh, monitor a patient, but monitor them very closely. Um, there is unquestionably um, an impact of paralysis, and particularly a flaccid paralysis, on venous uh, return in lower limbs. This device certainly improves venous return, so therefore uh, it may well assist uh, in those situations. The concern that I would have if the pa patient has no sensation of pain, uh, you may not be aware uh, of causing problem. That is distinct from somebody who has diabetic peripheral neuropathy, uh, where there is uh, experience emerging 
that it is an effective adjunct to offloading and vascular flow and infection control in patients with diabetic foot disease. Once the edema or wound has healed and the gecko device is no longer used, is it possible for circulation to revert and the edema or wound would return? Yes, um, and certainly in my practice, um, once we've healed those wounds with compression, we will always say they need to have their compression applied, usually by a stocking rather than a bandage, for the rest of their days. Uh, whether this could be used as an intervention uh, instead of or alongside uh, compression stockings to pr reduce the risk of recurrence is a question that's not been answered by research studies to date. Should the gecko device be a first line of treatment? It would seem that blood flow is a good thing. Why wouldn't you use it? Um, I'm speaking as a clinician and as an academic and I would say that you should not forget or ignore the hundreds of years of existing practice. You should also, however, is recognize the gaps in, in existing practice that mean that there's always need for improvement. Please do not go away from here thinking you can now stop bandaging every leg and you can apply this uh, on every lower limb wound. That is not the message that I would wish to convey. I'm suggesting to you is if you have challenging uh, lower limb wounds, this is something you want to think about and think about uh, in terms not only of perhaps benefiting healing, but controlling edema, influencing blood flow, and potentially reducing pain. You mentioned pain relief was, was a significant benefit for the patients in your study? That's correct. The interesting observation about um, compression is that many of those patients that I see, and uh, I, I will accept I have a perverse referral practice, um, will say, I've heard a lot about you, doctor. I know you can heal everything. You can do what you like, but you're not putting those tight bandages on my leg because they hurt. What I would surprised, pleasantly surprised with this device, is the patient spontaneously commenting on, on the significant reduction in pain. Please remember that to date, although I've shown you the data on t the first 20 patients, I have a total experience of treating 32 patients with this device. I would not consider an experience of that size sufficient for me to be really comfortable of knowing exactly where, when, and how to use this device to control pain. Thank you. This concludes our Q&A period for today's webcast. I'll turn it over to Douglas for closing remarks. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of Profuse MedTech, I would like to thank Professor Keith Harding for his presentation, and I would also like to thank you, um, our viewers, for your questions. As I mentioned at the outset, both the presentation materials and the valuation survey can be found by clicking on the links in the paperclip icon located in the lower right corner of the web player. I hope that this webcast has been a valuable tool in understanding how low frequency nerve stimulation can be utilized effectively via the new Gecko device to boost circulation for lower limb wounds. For more information, feel free to go to our website www.geckodevices.com at any time and you've got contact details there. I would encourage you to complete the online polling questions if you have not yet had the chance and I hope you enjoy the rest of your BAMI evening here in Toronto and hopefully the rest of the country is not too cold. I purposefully arranged for some British weather here in Toronto just to make Keith feel at home. Anyway with that good night and enjoy the rest of your evening.